Thank you very much, everyone, for coming on today. This is the um, sixth uh, session of the of the autumn um, series, uh, which we have dedicated to uh, space health, and uh, uh, with special reference to quantum effects of biology and what may be going on in on Earth and in in space. Uh, okay, so with no further ado, shall I ask uh, Bethany to share her screen? And uh, and take us through what we've been listening to for the last uh, five uh, lecture series, and then uh, that will lead into our, our discussion. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. Uh, so Jeffrey has given some context for the theme of this uh, autumn series. I'll run through the different presentations very briefly just to refresh our memories. Um, there was a large amount of information to condense into this very brief summary. So please forgive me if I've left anything out and please raise it in the discussion. And I've tried to be as accurate as possible to your talks and abstracts. So in summary, quick summary, the aim of this series was to explore more deeply the intersections between quantum biology and space research and how each may inform the other. The study of human health beyond low Earth orbit could provide evidence of the direct effects of altered electromagnetic and gravitational environments, the magnetic component of which has been neglected. This would yield important insights for astronaut health as well as terrestrial health and aging. So the series began with a wonderful talk by uh, Dr. Thomas Marshburn, Sierra Space and retired NASA flight surgeon and astronaut, about what it means to live and work in space. I wanted to start the summary with this picture, which Tom talked about during one of uh, taking during one of his spacewalks, because I thought it captured so many aspects that he talked about. It showcases the incredible developments in technology, the International Space Station, that space exploration entails. But it also reflects the human desire to take a photo, to record a moment of wonder. And Tom talked about what it was like to do human things like eating and washing your hair in space. In addition, Tom mentioned that when he was taking this photo, one of his feet slipped out of the foot restraint. And I can only imagine how that must feel to be so untethered in space. And I think it aptly summarizes the extreme conditions of space travel, the physiological, psychological and mental challenges that space travel entails. In the presentation, Tom mentions how physically challenging spacewalks are, the intense focus, the microseconds of sheer terror, in his own words, how cold, exhausted, dehydrated, and thrilled it leaves you. It seems no wonder then that astronauts show changes to so many biomarkers. All of these factors are stresses, never mind the new physical environment. And stress can be adaptive, but also maladaptive. Tom introduced us to some of the changes noted in astronauts and the timescales of adjustment, though he noted that this slide was an old one in terms of research. These changes range from neurovestibular disorientation and edema to ocular problems, cardiovascular atrophy, bone density loss, and lean body mass. While some of these changes can be mitigated, partly by a dedicated exercise program, some are more permanent. And Tom mentioned that bones remineralize and rebuild completely different architectures in space. Space remains a uniquely stressful environment and a profound reminder of the balance of nutrition, exercise, and rest that is essential to human survival. We then had Dr. Scott Smith uh, from Human Health and Performance uh, Directorate, NASA Johnson Space Center, who expanded on the aspect of nutrition. Because space is limited, well, space in space is limited, the food that astronauts eat has to be carefully selected for maximum health benefits and mitigation of space effects. For experiments conducted with actual astronauts, nutritional assessment includes pre- and post-flight evaluation of many biochemical markers reflecting protein status, vitamin and mineral status, bone health and renal stone risk, hematology, lipids, and more. During flight, body mass and dietary intake are also monitored. Ground analog research is also critical for expanding research opportunities. Analogs simulate elements of spaceflight, and while, while no one analog is perfect, they each provide unique advantages to model specific aspects of spaceflight. His research group has conducted several flight experiments over the past two decades and published findings on effects of spaceflight on vitamins, minerals, and hormones. They've documented dietary effects on, on bone health and the effects of oral contraceptive use on hyperalbuminia and venous thromboembolism risk. Yeah, I've focused on one of his key research findings that the optic disc edema, which affects approximately 20% of astronauts, is genetically predisposed. Specifically, genetic differences in one carbon meta metabolism affects B vitamin requirements and potentially affects the vascular and or structural biochemistry, leading to what NASA has dubbed SANS, spaceflight-associated neuroocular syndrome. 
an experiment being cu conducted on the ISS right now is testing a, a B vitamin supplement to measure. For our next session, we had uh, Professor Alistair Nunn from the Guy Foundation um, and University of Westminster, who gave an excellent introduction to the topic of mitochondria in space. Life on Earth has evolved for billions of years in the same environment, and as such is canalized into Earth's specific Goldilocks zone, with some room for adaptive hormesis. In space, however, the conditions change sufficiently to mean that we are outside of our flat envelope or operating zone. Alistair then discussed what this might mean in the context of, among th other things, the tensegrity of the cytoskeleton and all the important processes such as electron transport that depend on this. As any of you who have attended these lectures or lectures or interacted with the Gaia Foundation may know, mitochondria and metabolism are one of the Foundation's key interests. And I really like Alistair's description of the mitochondria as the canary in the coal mine, where mitochondrial dysfunction is an early warning uh, sign of suboptimal environment. Mitochondria are also an interesting context in which to consider quantum effects in biology. After Alistair, we had Professor Doug Wallace from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Research Institute. Doug is a world-renowned expert on mitochondria and bioenergetics. I thought this uh, slide put things into perspective, and I won't say that much about it, but it illustrates just how many diseases are associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria are key players in energetic concerns, but also calcium balance, epigenomic regulation, apoptosis, among other things. Doug also outlined some of the new directions that mitochondrial research is taking that intersect with quantum biology concerns. He showed some intriguing images of Christy aligning between a mitochondria. He discussed whether the distribution of charge across mitochondrial membranes, which in certain parts of mitochondria can be very concentrated, is giving rise to endogenous fields. He also talked about the fact that electrons and protons, which are key players in mitochondrial function, have spin half and are thus sensitive to fields which is very relevant in the context of this series. After Doug gave us a clearer idea of why mitochondria might react to different space conditions, we had Professor Afshin Beheshti from the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science show us that mitochondria are without a doubt influenced by space travel. He presented uh, copious amounts of data that testified to the fact that uh, mitochondria are changed by space travel. His research focusing in particular on microgravity conditions and space radiation. I can't possibly cover all the results that he presented, but will attempt to give an overview of some of the salient points. One of which is that space health might act as a sort of laboratory for medical research, where conditions that might take years to develop on Earth are accelerated by space travel. Some of these health risks are dependent on sex, but a lot are independent. These include renal and kidney issues, liver issues, ocular issues, the central nervous system can be affected, circadian rhythms are affected, there's muscle degeneration and bone, list, bone loss and a cancer risk. Um, this is a comprehensive cross-section of health issues that share mitochondria as a uniting factor. Action then moved on to talk about microRNAs and how these might relate to mitochondrial changes in spaceflight and act to mitigate this. A single microRNA has been estimated to regulate up to 500 mRNAs. MicroRNAs can float freely in the blood and are now known to be involved in all aspects of diseases. They're not only found in animals, but everything else living. Uh, they're also highly conserved across species. What is exciting about microRNAs in the context of space health is that they can be used as a biomarker. More excitingly, they can be used as a way to treat the damage incurred by space travel. And again, this is a vast simplification of the very detailed studies that I've presented that I don't have time to cover here. Our next session, uh, we then started to look more closely at the specific physical environment of space. Professor Chris Parada from the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine took us over the extensive research he has done on the physiological effects of radiation and microgravity. First, he took us over the radiation effects for two types of radiation, solar energetic particles and galactic cosmic rays. His group used the hemopoietic system, which produces blood and bone marrow cells, to investigate these radiation effects because it has been shown to be radiosensitive. They used humanized mouse avatars whose hem hem hemopoietic uh, or immune systems were repopulated with human uh, stem cells from healthy astronaut age donors to accurately define the risk of hematological malignancy following acute exposure to Mars mission equivalent doses of radiation. 
Among other things, they found increased splenomegaly, which acts as a biomarker. Chris had 72 slides, so there was a lot more detail than this. Than this. But uh, just briefly, I'll also mention that Perkman has shown some potential mitigating effects for the effects found. Chris then took us through similar experiments conducted in simulated microgravity conditions to determine whether microgravity impacts the ability of the human immune system to recognize and el eliminate hematological cancers. The results show that microgravity impairs the ability of hemopoietic stem cells to repair DNA damage and to differentiate into dendritic cells, key, which are key immune sentinels that detect tumors and prime an effective immune response. They also showed that microgravity markedly impaired the cytotoxic activity of human natural killer cells, uh, which are one of the body's first defenses against hematological tumors. The Guy Foundation has long been interested in aging and was uh, interested in whether space travel approximated an uh, accelerated aging paradigm. To tell us more about this in the context of microgravity, we had uh, David Berman from the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. Using chronic inflammation as a measure for aging and modeling this with machine learning, his group was able to accurately predict markers of aging such as frailty, morbidity, vascular, and immune aging. Turning to space travel, where things such as cancer risk, uh, cardiovascular health, viral reactivation, uh, sarcopenia, and sensory motor concerns intersect with conditions seen in aging, astronaut biospecimens taken before, during, and after spaceflight seem to confirm these simulated models. David went through a large amount of evidence for changes in bio biological systems due to simulated microgravity. These range from inflammatory changes to cytoskeletal rearrangements. Interestingly, these were successfully mitigated by Kirk Kirkwitton. His research group has also done extensive um, research on cardiac and cerebral organoids in microgravity conditions. He discussed so many interesting results, like the big reduction in heartbeat and cardiac organoids and the acceleration of the cardiac uh, cardiac trans 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 uh, clock. I don't have time to list all of the uh, interesting results, but thought I'd end with the changes to the brain organoids, given how important brain function is in so many contexts. Um, in cerebral organoids, microgravity activates some of the same pathways seen in aging and accelerates the aging uh, brain aging clock. So while gravitational fields in space health have been taken into account, uh, magnetic fields have been looked at purely in how they screen radiation. Uh, but spin chemistry suggests that weak fields can have a more direct influence on biological systems through the radical pair mechanism. In order to better understand this, we had Professor Jonathan Woodward from the University of Tokyo. While we are, uh, we are familiar with intrinsic properties of matter such as mass and charge, matter also has an intrinsic property called spin, which describes how it behaves in magnetic fields. Jonathan took us through a careful tutorial about how paired electron spins uh, from short-lived reaction intermediates can change their alignment with respect to each other to be in different states known as singlet or triplet states. And then because of the Pauli principle, only certain spin alignments result in chemical reactions which means that changing the spin alignments of paired electrons can favor or disrupt chemical reactions. And in this way, magnetic field changes can be translated into different chemical products, which may then be relevant in a biological context. He then explained the fact that radical pairs exhibit a very nonlinear response to magnetic fields with respect to the magnitude of the field. This is very simplistically for me because of time constraints, because the different strengths of either zero field, weak field, or strong field change a, par a parameter called the Zeeman effect, which describes the effect of external fields on the proportion of singlet and triplet states, and thus the chemical outcome. Hypermagnetic fields, such as those on Mars, or sometimes the moon, have been uh, neglected in space research, but the radical pair mechanism is a well-described mechanism for just demonstrating how they can have an effect on biological systems. In the second part of this session, Professor Wendy Bean from the Department of Biological Sciences, Western Michigan University, showed us just how these spin effects might translate into macroscopic outcomes. She reiterated uh, Professor Woodward's focus on how the spin dynamics can be changed by weak magnetic fields of less than one millitesla. She showed a variety of really interesting results, which I don't have the space to include. The summary of which, very simply, is that weak magnetic fields have an effect on the stem cell mediation of tissue growth in vivo in planaria, 
which have powerful regenerative properties. The results more spe specifically show that weak magnetic fields modulate blastema formation in wounded planaria. What is particularly interesting and what echoes um, Jonathan's presentation is that the strength of the magnetic field, either 200 or 500 microtesla, can give rise to opposite effects, either promoting or inhibiting these effects. Thus, the effect is not linear. It uh, obeys the logic of hormesis, like riding the line between adaptation and pathology. She also showed how stem cell manipulation by magnetic fields is linked to reactive oxygen species manipulation. Magnetic fields modulate the spin states of reactive oxygen species, and because rusts play an important role in stem cell proliferation, differentiation, and process of regeneration, magnetic fields uh, can regulate injury-induced uh, rust accumulation and thus regulate stem cell division and subsequent differenti differentiation through the downstream activate of activation of heat shock proteins. Professor Bean also showed that the reactive oxygen species responsible for this effect appear to be uh, superoxides rather than hydrogen peroxide. From new ideas in space health, such as the radical pair mechanism, which is well characterized and modeled, we moved in the final session to probably the biggest question in quantum physics, which is how to reconcile quantum theory with gravity. Dr. Nathan Babcock from Howard University gave an excellent introduction to the topic and how difficult it is to align the continuous theory of gravity with the discrete quantum world. I thought this picture gave a good overview of the development of physics with the chasm of ignorance separating us so far from the future with only philosophy making any inroads into this future. But despite the speculative philosophical uh, nature of quantum gravity, Nathan outlined a pro proposal by Vladimir Vidral on how to test quantum gravity using current day technology. Very simplistically, in the interest of time, passing mass through some sort of beam splitter, then using principles of superposition and interference, we might be able to tell whether the gravitational field is displaying uh, quantum properties. And this is a big step towards realizing quantum gravity experimentally, if not theoretically. Nathan also briefly mentioned what quantum gravity might mean for biological systems. We, heard, we have heard about the importance of spin in biology, but there's also an intriguing connection between the mathematics of spin and that of general relativity. Both Einstein's theory and the derivation of spin dictate the use of the symmetrized uh, energy momentum tensor. Then finally, we had Professor Vladimir Vidral from Oxford to explain the key ideas of quantum mechanics and how the very different aspects of particles and waves were reconciled. He also went into some detail about how Heisenberg demonstrated that classical physics can be salvaged in quantum terms by considering the numbers familiar to classical physics as Q numbers, which are matrices of many numbers rather than single numbers. As Vlatko put it, don't change the laws of mechanics, but upgrade the quantities. This can then allow for concepts such as super superposition and interference to emerge. He then talked about how this might be extended to incorporate gravity. In simple terms, does gravity understand how to put masses into superposition? He also gave some idea of where the field stands. So there are three fundamental constants involved, the Newton uh, Newtonian gravitational constant, big G, the speed of light, uh, C, and H bar, which tells us uh, all about quantum physics. We are very far from working on that corner called uh, the theory of everything, where all these constants are taken into account. But maybe, as Black just suggested, the place to start is at the intersection of G and H bar, where things don't have to travel at the speed of light. And finally, Flatko gave a sense of the scale of what it means to measure quantum gravity. So the fine structure constant is a fundamental physical constant that quantifies the strength of the electromagnetic interaction between elementary charged particles. The gravitational fine uh, structure constant is analogous, but for gravitational interaction. As you can see, the gravitational interaction is many orders of magnitude smaller, 10 to the minus 2, as opposed to 10 to the minus 45. This might suggest that electromagnetic effects will dominate over gravitational effects in biological materials. But Blackbird did suggest that there's still potential for measuring something like mass superposition in a lab setting. Exactly how this will translate into the realm of living matter is still a matter for debate. And with that, uh, we can move into the discussion. Essie, thank you very much indeed. So I, I, I put these points for discussion up and clearly we can we can wander off in other directions if you so wish. But 
I think that what we would try to establish from from this series and from from the group that, that we have online today is, you know, what are the fundamental concerns related to hypermagnetic fields and is mitochondrial function disrupted? What are the likely phenotypic presentations of longer term mitochondrial dysfunction in space and upon return with special reference to accelerated aging? Does this represent a morbidity or a more ballot and or a mortality concern? Uh, how can we test whether this is an issue? And if it is an issue, how can we evaluate and characterize it? And with a better understanding of the extent and scope of the problem, can we consider mitigations? How do we communicate these concerns, suggested research and subsequent findings to the appropriate uh, bodies that are involved in, in um, space travel? And if it turns out to be serious or, or, or sinister and difficult to mitigate, Will this alter long-term ambitions for extended human space travel? So those were some of the uh, 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 of discussion points. And I just wonder whether um, uh, at that point, uh, I could leave that up on the screen or just make it a bit smaller, um, whether I can invite uh, some of our um, speakers to to open our discussion. Could I, could I ask Doug, Doug Wallace, I, I asked you a question, Doug, when, when, um, when you gave your, your talk about what phenotype might we expect to see uh, if mitochondrial function is disruptive markedly, especially as uh, humans move beyond low Earth orbit? And does this uh, and how serious might this be? Uh, could, could we open with your thoughts on that? Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, this is uh, really a great opportunity to visit with you all about uh, what I think is a really fascinating topic. <clears throat> so. Um, uh, first of all, we strongly agree, or we strongly feel, hypothesize, that mitochondria is probably a quantum system, uh, as uh, Bent Bentony mentioned. Um, both electrons and protons have spin, and they're also subjected to magnetic fields. And we're very interested in the fact that the mitochondria may be also generating some of these magnetic fields and thus maintaining an interaction between the exogenous and internal magnetic fields as it relates to energy metabolism. So what would that mean? Well, if mitochondria are in fact <clears throat> affected by hypomagnetic fields, then what would be the phenotypes? And I think the best examples for those are to look at what we know clinically as the uh, clinical phenotypes of various mitochondrial dysfunction. <clears throat> now, to understand that, we need to start with uh, what are the ranges of mitochondrial dysfunction that we see in the clinic? So what is um, now well recognized are what are called primary mitochondrial diseases. These are diseases where you have mutations in either the mitochondrial DNA or a nuclear encoded gene where you have such a severe effect on the function that you get um, pediatric effects. So then you have a multi-system disease that in fact covers pretty much all of the um, characteristics that uh, Dr. Nunn mentioned in his picture of the mitochondria as the canary in the gold mine, or I think uh, uh, the Guy Foundation has proposed. Um, but we're very much of the opinion that most of the common diseases, uh, age-related diseases, are also fundamentally mitochondrial, and that mitochondrial aging is one of the reasons why these diseases have a delayed onset and progressive course. That is, people are inherited with a partial mitochondrial dysfunction, which is subclinical, but with the accumulated effects of aging, the mitochondrial function furthers declines till it crosses expression thresholds and then you get phenotypes. So what kind of phenotypes do we get? Well, we get metabolic syndrome, we get osteoporosis, we get cardiovascular effects, we get um, brain fog, uh, neurological diseases, uh, loss of memory, ophthalmological problems, um, and basically all of the symptoms that uh, we have been seeing in the space flight animals and humans that have come back. So um, from my perspective, the um, the uh, central theme of all of this is that the decline in mitochondrial function, which we've now documented as with uh, Ashton Behefsky and colleagues, is in fact strongly affecting mitochondrial function over long term, is really in fact the central feature that, that's uh, causing these effects. And then over the long term, 
you will get a decline in function. But I believe ultimately, if there's not mitigation, ultimately it will affect mortality. So that's, uh, I feel, a sort of a central way of looking at all of these questions from a mitochondrial perspective. Doug, thank you very much indeed. It's it's interesting that you, in your last point, you said it might affect mortality because when we discussed this before, I think your view was we would see severe and serious uh, uh, pathophenotypes, but not mortality. Have, have you changed your view or, or modified it in a way? Well, it uh, it's a time uh, factor, Jeffrey. Um, what's unique about aging in humans is we go along seemingly pretty well with uh, some decline, um, but then it's as if people fall off a cliff. And then when it, within a relatively short time, uh, their phenotypes get much worse and they go on and die. Um, the, we can explain, we can hypothesize how this could be uh, by arguing that um, mutations in the mitochondrial DNA accumulate randomly with age and that we have thousands of copies. So we accumulate more and more damage until there's enough some defect that it results in organ failure. And so what we have is by having a high copy number of mitochondrial DNA, we have a buffer. But when you achieve the end of that buffer, it's just like a change in pH. Suddenly, uh, your indicator will change from red to blue or whatever. Um, so I think um, if we're thinking about someone staying on Mars for their entire lifespan, I think it is going to significantly affect mortality. If we're thinking about someone on the moon for two months, I think that's a very different um, situation.